what's going on. I have no memories of anything before this point in time. My mind is tabula rasa, yet I have a language. I seem to be in some laboratory of sorts. Maybe I can find out what happened if I look around. Holy shit, look at her spine. My very first memory is waking up on this thing. Before that, nothing. I wonder what I am. My very first memory is waking up on this thing. Before that, Books. A lot of natural philosophy and chemistry. Something by an M.W. Shelley. A torture device turned into a strange machine. What kind of place is this? There's a handwritten note here. Maybe it can shed some light on my situation. Wow, that's tiny ass prints. Ahem. It's with shaking hands and heavy heartbeats I gather before me the instruments of my last desperate attempt. I find myself on the threshold of my toils, a turning point. For should I fail tonight, I doubt I shall find the strength and resolve to continue. On my feet now lay the lifeless remains of my beautiful Belladonna. A few hours ago, my wife was alive and well, and now she has been cut open, dissected, altered, and artificially reconstructed. From the second she gave up her final breath, I have worked tirelessly to preserve and prepare her corpus, that I might infuse a spark of being back into her lifeless limbs. This is the final test of all my research and experimentation in the past five years. The complete revivification of a human being body and soul. The anxiety I feel is agonizing, but I cannot let it hinder me from carrying out what I must do. For my own sake and for hers, the procedure must not fail. In my feverish dreams, my wife appears as such a lovely creature, so far removed from this creation before me. Her cheeks, once so full of laughter, are now pale, almost to the point of transparency, with the skin stretched so thin over the cranium it threatens to rip at any moment. Her eyes would shine like the night sky, but are now empty, watery, and yellowish. I have to cling to my conviction that she will regain her former grace and vitality when she is brought back to the realm of the living. Her eyes will light up with the flame of life, a Promethean flame stolen from the very gods. From this night on, man shall be the master of his own destiny, and God shall no longer be above us. As I write, the engines, uh, yeah, the engines of life are finally heating up, the last of the preparations coming into order. The crucial moment is ever approaching, the time has come. Success, the attempt was a success. She's alive! Now is not the time. There's a screwdriver in this toolbox. Better take it. brain in a jar. I wonder what it's thinking. A human skull or a paperweight? This oil looks expensive. Let's waste it. It looks like the legs of a frog hooked up with wires. And I'm pretty sure it moves when I'm not watching. I love magnets. I have no idea what's inside of this, but it glows. <laughs> that is one ugly gargoyle. Looks like a George to me. Ooh, surgical tools. Shiny. The toolbox is empty. The door won't budge. It seems to be barred from the other side. I might be able to unscrew these hinges, though. The screws on these hinges are rusty and stuck. 
I need some lubricant to loosen them up. I smeared Zoe, some oil honey. on the rusty screws. That should loosen them up. Zoe! Make me? I'm oh. free! find my life more and more polarized into two phases. I remember times where I used to climb up and down the stairs like a squirrel each day, but now I spend most of my time, and indeed most of my thoughts, down here in my laboratory, only to step upwards at night to sleep. It is warmer upstairs in the living area, but it is boring and understimulating. Down here is where I make a progress. Down here is what matters, and as I lay awake beside my sleeping wife, I often wonder, I often wish I were down here with my experiments. Belladonna grows increasingly distant ever since that fateful night when our baby Lucas gave up his last breath. She has all lost traces. She has all but lost. She has lost all traces of her old self. So! God knows what she is thinking about as she silently gazes into the empty air or viciously paces back and forth in the Great Hall. I, at least, am working with my grief. I have turned my attention to the science of life and death, and not a day goes by when I do not think of how my son was untimely taken from me. This is the thought that drives me, and this the greatest of ambitions. My own son will never return. I have accepted that now, but thanks to me and my work, the cold, ruthless contrast between living and dead will be in the future, will in the future be much softer, maybe even completely erased. My wife, though, has let our grief devour her whole. She's emotionally and intellectually paralyzed, it seems to me. All her creativity and quickness of thought, the wittiness of her speech, and the nimble way she used to jump from one conclusion to the next. All these qualities that made me fall in love with her in the first place, they have all been snuffed out like the flame of a, of a candle. So, this makes me wonder even more why I bother to go up to her bed every night. The shell in which she has enclosed herself cannot be breached by anything I say or do. It is almost as though she is involved with someone other than me. I feel ridiculous for even writing it down. No. It seems ludicrous to think that Belladonna's disinterest in me is due to her seeing another man. I will not accuse her of that. It is just one of the many strange ideas that seems to appear in my head when I am down here by myself. I'm probably just tired. I better try and get some sleep as soon as the rat's heart stops beating. I curse my miserable existence, the hopelessness from which I see no conceivable escape. I cannot rid myself of the feeling that there is something of utmost importance that I need to take care of, but that is, but that it is not yet time. That something beyond my control needs to be completed first. I carry inside me a sensation of waiting, yet I cannot name the thing I am waiting for. In the meantime, all I can do is work. I do make progress, but at an excruciatingly slow rate, and nothing I accomplish seems to calm the anxiety in my head. I sleep only a few hours every night, and cannot remember my last hot meal. I am feverish and jump at the smallest of sounds. What is it that I am missing? I am spending more and more time down here with my research. I only occasionally go upstairs to sleep in the master bedroom. Most nights I sleep, if at all, in a makeshift bunk I have constructed in the cellar. It is not as comfortable, but my research is at a point where it oftentimes requires my constant attention, and comfort is not my priority. I'm certain I am advancing ever closer to a significant breakthrough, and it is as though I am powerless to control or even affect the rate of its occurrence. And on top of this, I cannot rid my mind of the idea that Belladonna has forgotten me and taken a new lover. A new man in her life, someone more lively than me, perhaps? Someone who can still look at life with joy and optimism to match her own by grave tragedy and affected humor? Yet who would that be? I can remember friends we used to have. In my memory, our wedding was a crowded and festive event. But it has been years since the castle has seen any visitors. I have no time for social obligations, and Belladonna seems to have given up on everything that is pleasant in life. I suspect the castle is in, is in an undesirable condition as well. Almost all of the uh, staff has left us. We are down to one girl who dusts the cupboards and lights the fireplaces, but I don't see much of her either these days. For all I know, she may be gone as well. There cannot possibly be a man in Belladonna's life apart from me. Not that you're actually in her life much. Hello, Roland. <coughs> Hello, Roland. Oh, there was a stick here. It, up already. it looks like someone has been sleeping quite a lot in this sorry excuse for a bed, and it was hardly the suit of armor. But 
Why would someone choose to sleep down here? The game crashed, so I have to like, I had to uh, re uh, re-record the stuff. I believe there was a note up here too, if everyone that I just read. Let's see if they'll crash me. Another locked door. Let's take a peek through. It's the key I'm after. I can't reach it with my hands. I wonder what I can invent to retrieve it. The stick is long enough to reach the key, but how will I grab it? Alright, number four, when I tried to combine the magnet and the stick, the game crashed. I'm still in your the game. Try it. of the stick. Oh no, it worked. I guess I just couldn't do it when it was in that- Another place. locked door. Let's take a peek. Let's hope this works. Haha! -ha. Just as planned. I got the basement key! So... Good, honey. Zoe! I forgot that she wanted to talk. More letters. Has he figured it out yet? I see now that my suspicions have been well grounded, albeit aimed in the wrong direction. Belladonna is not seeing other man, she's seeing a woman. I am convinced that it must be that maid, Claire or whatever her name might be. She and Belladonna are up to something, I'm sure of it. And to think of all the hours I'm stuck down here, caught up in my dreadful work, leaving them free to roam and left to their own devices upstairs. Of course they have found each other, only living things in the whole castle besides me are, and my, uh, and my week-long rabbits. They have it all figured out. When I come up at night, they act all innocent, keeping their mutual secret from me as a playful game. But as soon as I descend into the laboratory, they are in each other's arms again. What can I do? The progression of events are beyond my control, just like my work. I sleep away in my ghoulish endeavor, making progress every hour, but never getting anywhere. Simultaneously, Belladonna is slipping away from me. <clears throat> further and further for every night, and yet nothing ever changes. Should I confront them? Storm up there hoping to catch the two in the act? Take back the life that was mine, the wife that was mine? No. I have no reason for my slight suspicions, no evidence whatsoever. Merely a thought stuck in my brain, refusing to leave. So I remain passive, as always, and each new day is one more where I am unable to make an action, unable to change my wretched situation. So. This is the nail from which I skillfully lifted the basement key. A couple of cogwheels on the floor. They must have fallen off the mechanism when the door slammed shut. I wonder if I can put them back. Nothing happens. What a strange door. No handle or keyhole. It seems to have some sort of opening mechanism. Oh, I know. It's a secret entrance hidden behind a bookshelf. Only, I'm on the other side of it and see only the back of the shelf. Not yet. Oh. Not yet. Not yet. Big and heavy candlestick. It looks like there used to be two of them. It's a mortar. And a pestle, too. They seem to belong here, but I'll remember where they are in case I need them another time. The label says Dr. Wolfram von Trauerschloss. So this is the man who brings the dead back to life. He looks as though he would have been handsome once. It's warm. I haven't realized until now just how cold my body is. The doctor is losing it. He's just scribbling down nonsense by now. What will he do if he ever acts on his wild suspicions? It is clear to me what I must do. I am 
am now convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that my wife is unfaithful. They still hide very well, her and that housemaid. My lo logical mind tells me there is no other explanation. For countless hours I have pondered the situation, and the more I think about it, the more certain I become that my judgment is correct. These countless hours are hours I could have spent thinking about my work. It is clear to me that I will never be able to fully concentrate on the puzzles at hand as long as my thoughts keep creeping back to my wife and her new lover. This is the very reason that my research is progressing at such an agonizingly slow pace. So it is clear to me what I must do. Belladon herself is the person who I want back into my life, so I cannot punish her. It leaves her lover to the young maid. She is unimportant, and it is she that must go. I could fire her and throw her out of the household, but I fear this would not resolve anything. Two of them would still know of each other, and they could write secret forbidden love letters or meet up at secluded rendezvous. Now it is clear to me that what I must do, and I must get rid of the maid for good. A plan is already taking form in my head. In the greenhouse out back, I keep a lot of plants and herbs. One of the specimens I have is called Deadly Nightshade, an interesting plant with many medical uses, but it's renowned for the fact that it, its extract is lethal already at small doses. Preparing a powder from this poisonous plant is not at all problematic. Getting the victim to adjust the dose would be a challenge, but I expect to have an ample opportunity. They are not aware I know the truth, and they suspect nothing. The maid will fall ill, and within a short time she will die of seemingly natural causes. No one will be the wiser concerning the true circumstances of her demise. I think Deadly Nightshade is merely the common name for the plant. Its scientific name is a trope of Belladonna. The symmetry strikes me as beautiful. The poor girl strayed too far to the Belladonna, and that would be the death of her. A beautiful china bowl. It looks hand-painted. I wonder where the other candlestick is gone. The story is so sad. I don't even know if I want to read this one. My wife took the wayward maid's death harder than I had expected, further confirming my suspicions that they were indeed having a secretive love affair. She is passionate and irrational, raging all day and crying all night. Where a few months ago the cold shrine of silence lay over our house. Now there is the wailing shrieks of bedlam. One should think that she would be used to dealing with the grief of lost loved ones by now. However, in all sincerity, I don't believe she was ever as affected by the death of our only son as I was. I also suspect that she might have guessed I had something to do with her lover's demise. If she wouldn't talk to me before, now she yells and barks at my every movement. I hardly leave my laboratory these days. I even have a small bed down here where I sleep a few hours when I'm not working. All the while, she prowls around upstairs like a hungry tiger and attacks me over futile nitpicks as soon as I put my head out. What happened to the love we shared when we, when we married? We were going to live together in her inherited castle. We were going to have children together. Now all I get is abuse and a cold bed in the basement. All I want is for things to go back to the way they were before all this. The name on the plaque is Lucas von Trauerschloss. This must be the ashes of Wolfram's son. short sting. It's the body of Dr. Von Trauerschloss. He's dead. And what's more, he's been murdered. But who could have done this? There must be some clues around. The missing candlestick. And it seems to be the murder weapon. Blood is flowing from a wound in his skull. I wonder if he was alive when he was killed, or if he was just a mechanical cadaver like me. There is no clockwork or artificial parts that I can see. But how can you tell? The body is still warm. He cannot have been dead for much longer than I have been alive. Did he have to die for me to live? The back of his head has been cracked open by a heavy blow. He couldn't have seen the attack coming. He was dead before he knew what happened. So, he trusted his assailant then? Was it me? I have no memories from my life before. Maybe it was I who killed him. But then, how was I brought back? There's something in his pocket. It's a small, delicate key. He kept it in the pocket closest to his heart. I wonder what it unlocks. 
These are the hands that give life. Talk about meeting your maker. There's a letter clutched in his hand. His final words are a clue left by the killer. Over the course of a sleepless night, I have thought through my next course of action from every possible angle, for it is indeed time for me to take action again. Even with the troublesome maid out of the way, I see little chance of getting my old Belladonna back. If anything, she is worse now than ever before. But I have an idea, one that kept me awake all night. I have come very far in my research by now. I can now fairly predictably create living creatures that are stable enough to not spontaneously die again. This is consistent through many different species of animal. I have noticed something peculiar, though. The return of creation seems strangely vacant and sluggish. It is as if, although the body is brought back to life, the soul is forever lost. The creation is perfectly functional and responds to stimuli just as if it were truly alive. But the mysterious spark of will seems to be missing. I know no other way to describe the phenomenon. This bothered me before, but now I cannot help to think that this might suit my needs. Isn't it precisely the strong will of my wife that is causing all my problems? There is no need to be poetic with flowers this time. I am in no sort of supply of lethal substances in the laboratory, and poison suits my needs well, as it leaves no physical trauma on the body. I will still need to make incisions in the corpse to replace internal organs with clockwork parts, but stitching together surgical cuts is much simpler than trying to repair unhealed bodily damage. The integrity of her visage is a priority. To extinguish Beldana's current life and give her a new one, to bring her body and mind back, minus soul and free will, a beautiful obedient automaton, a mechanical doll with all of the functionality of a woman, but who is responsive and does what she's told, that, that, my dear future reader, would be something, would truly be something. I think it's high time I tried my revivification process on a human subject. Those are a lot of gargoyles. Leupold, Brunhilde, Arthur, Maya, Lena, Ismuldor, Ether, and Josef. In that order. This letter is signed Belladonna. I've been waiting to hear the other side of this story. If you, uh, if you had asked me just a few years ago about my future, I would never have fathomed my life today would be as it is. So strange a path has the twists of fate set upon me set me upon that I make every wake every morning bewildered, and like a small child I expect anything and everything to happen during each new day. The night my planned future snapped out of the joint and took a whole new direction was the night my son Lucas died. I married Dr. Wolfram von Trauerschloss in the spring, and we loved each other deeply back then. How young we were. He was an educa he was an educated gentleman from the University of Ingolstadt, and I had first assumed we would get a flat in Vienna. Instead, he convinced me we should live in my family's old castle and accept our roles as old-fashioned nobility to the little village down the hill. We moved into the castle with a staff of thirty servants, beginning the task of breathing life and joy into the majestic hills, halls. At this time, I expected to live out my life as a lady in the household, minding the servants, and indeed raising children. Before long, our first son was born, and shortly after that, he once again departed. I was devastated, of course, but... Lucas had been sick from his first day, and even though my husband had blocked out the possibility from his mind, I was not entirely surprised when it happened. Nonetheless, it changed us. I believe Wolfram blames me for what happened, that he thinks it was somehow my fault. He retreated into his laboratory in the old dungeon and started doing unholy experiments and God knows what. Those were dark times. Instead of a household and a child to take care of, I now had no guests, practically no husband, and no child. Everything I thought would occupy my time was gone and all I could do was grieve in solitude. The castle staff were full by one until there was only a handful still here. My existence was meaningless, and I spent my days doing nothing. But I dealt with my grief in my own way, and in time the claws of melancholy began loosening their grip on me. In so many ways, I have Clara to thank for that. It's an old clock. Tick tock, tick tock. This room looks completely abandoned. I suppose this is what happens when you're down to a skeleton crew of only one maid, no matter how fantastic she is. It's snowing outside. I have no concept of the current year, season, or even geographical location. 
Another journal page. This one has drops of blood on it. Belladonna. See, I, Belladonna, must think, remember, hands, fingers, write words, and something. Another portrait. It says her name is Francisca Canosa, an old relative, no doubt. But I wonder how she relates to the von Trauerschloss family. Look at all these old toys. Wind-up dolls, music boxes, and mechanical trains all around. I think this used to be a private hobby of the eccentric Dr. Wolfram's, before he got into the whole corpse business. That's a lot of books. Imagine you had books filled with every possible combination of letters. I wonder how much room they would take. There's a finite amount of letters, but unless we acknowledge a maximum length of a word, there would still be an infinite number of combinations, and the library would have to be infinitely large. Look, a perfect sphere. Let's see if I can get two parallel lines to intersect. What? Why? Look. The doctor's handwriting. I know it well by now. Once that passed, and I must indeed conclude that the, pro that the procedure was a success. The new Belladonna is certainly calmer, friendlier, and more docile. She gladly keeps me company in the laboratory nowadays, and she is polite and pleasant in everything she does. One is tempted to describe her demeanor as lobotomized, but no. When I ask her questions, she will answer in a clear and articulated voice, and she is responsive to all kinds of stimuli. Verily, I have gotten all I could ask for. A troublesome maid is gone, and Belladonna is back with me, compliant as ever. Her behavior is exemplary. Our lives are returning to that idyllic past I had thought lost in all aspects except one. No child giggles in these halls. My research is proceeding rapidly, and the question presents itself. Who needs a womb to create life? I have made an unexpected observation, a side effect of the unliving condition. The household cat, a black beast and once Belladonna's loving pet, has gained a great mistrust from the latter's new form. A disquiet has fallen over the animal, and he will not go near the creation. Why is this, I wonder? Why this lack of trust? This sudden and ferocious hatred? Belladonna's appearance seems to me not much unlike what the cat before so fondly gravitated towards, but evidently the beast perceives a difference. As a species, the cat has popularly been associated with witchcraft and mysticism. Their eyes do indeed strike one as remarkable. It is perchance so that the feline oculus is capable of peering into a human soul and spirit, and so when faced with the created Belladonna, it is distressed by the lack thereof? What about you, Zo? I should sit down and write a story. But with all these journals and diary pages lying around, it seems like I already may have. I'm not going near that horrible cat. Zoe. I'll have to get rid of it somehow if I want to proceed. What an abhorrent cat. It looks at me with pure hate in its eyes. What's that thing it's playing with? I'm not going near that horrible cat. I'll have to get rid of it somehow. Interesting, but no. Zoe, honey. I'm not going. So. A stuffed raven atop a bust of Pallas Athena. What a cheerful decoration. Let's call them Annabelle and Dupin. There's a bottle of milk out here. I wonder how long it's been here. At any rate, it's frozen completely solid. No wonder in this cold. One more Belladonna letter. Let's read about this Clara figure. Clara Stiver was one of the several chambermaids we hired when we moved into the castle shortly after the marriage. In the warm light of recent events, I feel as though I could pick her out of a crowd already at this time. 
but I suspect that the truth is that she was just another servant, one of many. They didn't pay her close to the attention I now know she deserves. The time following the death of Lucas is hazy and unclear in my, in my memory. I know I spent most of my time in an armchair in the living room, staring out the window. I know now that this must have been a difficult time for the staff as well. My apathy left them without purpose, as more and more of the household was shut down. Soon the cooks and stable grooms began abandoning what they have always identified as a sinking ship. As more and more of the staff left the castle to seek employment elsewhere, there was less and less reason for the rest to stay, and the household was quickly decimated. But throughout all of this, young Clara never left my side, and she gradually shouldered more and more of the household responsibilities, making it her task to take care of me and nurse me through my melancholy. It was her loyalty and industriousness where everyone else left that finally brought me back from my condition. And indeed her love. As I now sit down to write it, it has been a long, unbroken chain of, unha of happy days. Clara and I have the whole castle perfectly to ourselves and nothing to do but enjoy our lives with each other. We sleep in a new room every night, cook our own food, and have picnics under tables or in front of the fireplace. We have no incentive whatsoever to uphold convention and norms when this house has become like a secret, a secure pocket inside the rest of reality. In truth, this touches on what I treasure most in Clara. Neither of us reap any concrete benefits from our union, neither financial nor societal. There is no embedded purpose of producing heirs. Our relationship exists solely for itself and its own reward. I am already adapting her affordable, ha her adorable habit of naming inanimate objects. The castle is not quite ours, however. Wolfram still lurks like a ghost downstairs, and occasionally emerges and spends a night up here with me. We have little in common anymore. In fact, he's like a completely different, a completely new person. His, mi his mind is vacant, his stare distant. He's thinner than ever before and shivers with cold. Clara jokingly suggested that we might have him declared mad and sent off to an institution. It is an idea in her mind, but with some planning, this might actually prove to be our surest path to finally reclaiming this castle for us alone. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>